have in my notes here, you know, to welcome you. Uh, that's how literal my notes are. So welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so tonight, uh, I wanted to give a little talk about how to view art. And obviously, because we're at a meditation center, we're talking about a contemplative viewing process as opposed to just a viewing process. Uh, one of the questions that I was thinking about, and at, at this time it's a rhetorical question, and we'll actually have a question and answer section, is what do we do when we um, want to go and view art, whether it be at a gallery or a museum or whatever. And uh, For years I found myself uh, wanting to get as much information as I could in advance. Uh, I would want to learn about the artist, I would want to learn about the art, anything that I could, ask my friends, gather as much information as possible. Uh, because I, I wanted to be able to see what I was supposed to see. It would be terrible if I actually saw something without that information, right? So what the contemplative viewing process is about is allowing us uh, ourselves to have our own experience, to be able to trust our own experience, rather than arm ourselves in advance. Because what happens when we arm ourselves in advance? What do we do? We see exactly what we've read, what we've been told, and we take everything that we have learned or know and use it as a filter to the process. So we're actually narrowing down everything to uh, meet our expectations, our preconceptions, and our um, basically uh, prejudgments. Um, we become very judgmental about it. We even evaluate it before, are we going to like this? If somebody asks me a question, am I going to have the answer to the question? If I didn't study enough, know enough, or whatever. So we could describe this process in, in one, uh, and actually in several ways, but one of the ways I like to do it is this notion of looking and seeing. And most of the time what we're doing is we're trying to see before we've actually looked. And what looking uh, is about is being able to put aside, at least for uh, a brief time, everything that you know, all your judgments, and just experience what's before you. And that's not, that's, that's actually easier said than done. It's not so easy to do. And that's what uh, the meditation process and, and practice itself can benefit this viewing process because what do we do in meditation? It's a very simple process of coming back over and over again. We're actually training our mind to come back to what uh, those of us in Shambhala art or who study meditation in the creator process call coming back to square one. Um, I suspect a lot of you have heard that term before in a lot of different environments. For, for us, what it means is we're coming back to an environment where we're not ruled by our thoughts. We're not ruled by emotions. It doesn't mean they're gone. It just means that there's a little bit of space between them. Enough space that something else can arise, such as an actual experience of some kind, as opposed to uh, more thoughts about thoughts about thoughts. So if we try to apply uh, what we learn and practice in meditation to the viewing process, one of the things that it is uh, that we do is when thoughts and emotions uh, arise, uh, we let them kind of dissolve on their own. Or depending upon the technique that you have, you may even label them thinking and come back to your breath. Except in the process that we're talking about here, we're talking about the object of meditation. We're kind of doing a little sort of magic trick in the sense that we're switching out the object of meditation. We're switching it out from coming to rest resting our minds on our breath, to resting our minds on what's before us. And by the way, when I say before us, I really mean that what we're, what we're talking about is not just what's visually before us, but the sense of environment and space that we are in. Uh, your uh, felt sense of yourself in that space. And I, in fact, I should define that term felt sense. Felt sense is a term that I'd like to use in contrast to uh, what's called thought sense. Felt sense is, uh, we're not re I'm not really using it as an emotional sense. I'm using it that if you rest all your senses, all your five senses, and in the meditation tradition there's a sixth sense, and that sixth sense is very simply just your mind, 
That's where all the senses kind of collect uh, and are rationalized into an experience. So you're taking all of those uh, senses, uh, including your mind, and resting uh, them on what's before you. And you have an experience of that. That's pre-thought, uh, pre-culture, pre-language. Uh, we sometimes refer to it as an intuitive sense uh, about things. So there is this notion of felt sense, which is about experience. It's about direct experience. Okay, so that's my definition of that term. And thought sense is everything we think, everything we know, all our ideas, uh, every bit of knowledge, uh, and that gives us uh, a thought sense of what's going on. And as it turns out, our experience is really composed of both of these things. It's this intuitive felt sense and then knowledge, everything that we, we know. And in terms of viewing art, the goal really is to lead with one's felt sense. So that when you come up to a piece of artwork uh, or a performance or a show or even someone reading uh, poetry or uh, anything that you can uh, think of, the goal is, is to lead with your felt sense as opposed to your thought sense. Because if you lead, think about this, if you lead, think about this, uh, if you lead <laughs> with your thought sense, uh, what do you have? You have thoughts about thoughts about thoughts about thoughts, which may accidentally, uh, coincidentally, actually apply to your experience, but you don't know unless you've had an experience first. So the notion is, is that if the felt sense comes first and you lead with that, then whatever thoughts and knowledge that you have after that is actually grounded in real experience. So that when you go to a show or an exhibit, if we can manage to put things aside, just as we come back to our breath repeatedly, if we can let our thoughts dissolve, our preconceptions uh, dissolve, and rest our senses on what we're perceiving uh, and have our own experience, then what comes out of that experience is usually quite genuine to the experience. Whatever thoughts you have, uh, often they're marked by being more vivid than other thoughts. They seem to resonate with your experience. And um, uh, Anne and I do contemplative viewing and have taken people to museums and galleries, and I do that in the class that I teach at Art Center. Uh, we find that when people then try to articulate what comes out of that felt sense, allowing that thought sense to arise out of that felt sense, they find themselves actually describing the artwork. In some cases, better than the art historian who might have uh, labeled it. Uh, it comes very close to the nature of it so that we can learn through this process of actually relaxation and resting our senses uh, to trust our own experience. That we don't need someone to tell us what to feel and what to think. Now, if you lead with your felt sense, as we talk about it, if you lead with your intuitive sense, if you lead with that experience that comes from resting your senses, there's the implication that the thought sense that occurs afterwards is somehow secondary because it comes ideally after. And it's not. It's as important as the felt sense, but it needs to be ordered so it doesn't act as a filter. When it arises out of the, this felt sense, when it arises out of this direct experience, then it informs your experience. In fact, it creates a container for it so that you can understand it and further appreciate it and actually go back and have a second look, a, a new square one, which is more encompassing. It's not like, oh, I now have this new information. I'm now going to arm myself with it and filter the process all over again. The second time, I was nice enough not to do it the first time. I'm going to do it the second. No, it's not like that. You actually still let it go the second time. It's just like you come back to your breath you drift off. You don't say, okay, I did my job. You come back to your breath over and over again. Every time you uh, forget that you're supposed to be following your breath, you return to it in terms of meditation. And the, this kind of viewing process, you're constantly coming back to this felt sense, this square one, this direct experience, see what arises, and that helps uh, create the environment for greater appreciation when you go back. 
So from this point of view, it's actually okay to study up on the artist. It's okay to find out everything that you can find out. It's actually a benefit to get to educate yourself about almost anything that you view. As long as you practice letting it go when you're actually uh, doing this contemplative viewing process to have your own connection to things rather than have it filtered uh, through um, uh, prejudgments and preconceptions and so forth. And uh, this is probably uh, maybe a little too technical, but if you like to study about meditation, we're really talking about uh, something called sense perceptions and sense consciousnesses. And the way it works is, is that when we come to rest in a meditator process, sense perceptions always occur first for obvious reasons, to perceive and then you realize. You look and then you see. You go, oh, and then you go, aha. So that process takes place naturally until we become afraid, until we hope for something to be some way other than it is, and fear that it won't be. So uh, part of this is a practice of learning to relax, uh, don't worry <laughs> when you go to look at artwork, uh, and learn how to train, in a sense, to come back to your own experience of it and to trust it. Uh, one of the things I encourage people to do is to take a little notepad and avoid the label. Uh, and in fact, uh, let's, let's do a little, actually we can do a little exercise, a very brief exercise that I had in my notes and because I looked away. Uh, it's coming slightly out of order, but I think it's still going to work. So what I'd like you to do is if you could dig out a personal object, a small personal object, and place it in front of you where you can comfortably view it. Okay. So it can be very simple. Uh, it's sometimes helpful for it to be the more personal, the better. But, you know, don't stress about it. Just place it out in front of you. A watch, a ring, I guess your keys. For some people, just taking out some money and putting it on the floor is a big deal. So <laughs> we may ask for a donation at the end of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> but does everybody have some kind of object in front of them, just where they can rest their eyes on it comfortably? So this is what I'm going to ask you to do for several minutes. It won't be long. Don't panic. Okay. <laughs> so I know I know entertainment's important in Los Angeles, particularly, but. So what I want you to do is to rest your eyes on, on the object. And then if you're a person who knows about mindfulness meditation, where you come back and rest your mind, your senses on your breath, in this case is I'm going to ask you to do something very simple, which is to rest your mind on the object in front of you. We're going to just do this for, I'm not telling you the exact number of minutes, because I don't want you to start looking, especially if you have a watch, timing it and stuff like that. So uh, I'm going to look at mine so that I can time this. And then I just want you to, every time you drift off, and why, by drifting off, I mean either visually or you start going off into thoughts and it's like, what am I doing here? Just bring yourself gently, simply back to resting whatever senses you can on the object in front of you for the next few minutes. So whatever you understand that I've just said, try to accomplish that for the next several minutes and then I, I will time us. And for those people watching a videotape, they'll just have to sit through this and maybe, maybe they have an object they can put out in front of themselves and come back to for the next several minutes. Okay, the next part of this exercise is to swap your object with someone else um, nearby. Hopefully it's not swapping for an object that you know well from the other person. And place that where you can rest your eyes on. No discussion, if you can. Little or no discussion. Now rest your eyes on this object. We'll do another very brief, briefer. So rest your senses on it. Okay, you can look up. Don't return the object just yet. So there's a much longer version of this exercise that you've been relieved of. 
But the question that I have to you that's one of the points of this exercise has to do with, uh, did you notice anything different between resting your senses on your object as opposed to an object that was not yours or unfamiliar? Oh, we have, all right, we have a mic. Yeah, so since we're recording it, My object I was familiar with, and it was a lot simpler. The one that I received was hard with writing on it. So it was something that, I don't know if you want to call it more complex, but it was something that I constantly was reading. Mm -hmm. So that's how it was different for me. Okay. Would anyone else like to share? Carl? It was a lot easier uh, looking at the other person object because my name was on that one and whatever and there was just a lot of thoughts projected onto it so I could see this object precisely from the beginning. Okay, I want to There was a, pursue too that. Too much was going on. But since I saw some nodding heads, I would love to uh, uh, well, I did, did would you like to share? You don't have to. I just saw your nodding head. Yeah, I basically had the same experience where, you know, my my little thing was something that my mom gave me and there's a lot of emotional connection to it. So it was very hard for me to just see it for what it was, just see it you know, for what it was. A simple object. Right. Um and then when I got the swatch to look at, um there was, you know, nothing attached to it and it was just very interesting how I could see it for the watch that it was. And there's you no know, <laughs> How many people shared that experience? Okay, so you know, don't don't push yourself into anything. But what I want to elucidate, and if you do this exercise again at home um, with your own object, even if you don't have an unfamiliar object, uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, let me backtrack for a moment. When you receive an unknown object. We rest our senses on it, and there isn't any history, right? So we, we don't see that history, we see the object. When we have our own object, we see a lot of history. And then when I normally assign this, I assign it to do 20 to 30 minutes with your personal object. Now, for some of you, just hearing that amount of time already tells you, what, that you're probably gonna get really bored Right? And what happens is, is that personal history begins to evaporate and dissolve. It doesn't really disappear. It's still sort of there in the background. But you start glimpsing your object as if it was someone else's, un uh, someone else's object and unfamiliar to you. You just simply rest your senses on it. What I'm trying to do is to crack open this little door. You can actually look at artwork for which you might know the name of that artist. You might know the history. You might even be an art historian. You may be a painter, but for at least a brief period of time, you can let that go. It might take you a little longer in the beginning to let it go, but you can let it go and have your own direct experience of whatever it is before you. Because as it turns out, the viewing process is not a passive process. It's not one where all the work is supposed to be done by the maker of the art or the performance. We have to be willing to be open. We have to be willing to rest our senses on it to perceive it. I realized today that so many of us are uh, jaded that there's even an art form now called abject art, which is basically artwork that is so incredibly repulsive that it just shocks you to the very core. But the issue with that for us is yes, it may break down our thought patterns, our storylines, and something may happen, but our reaction to it then fills up that empty space all over again in some other fashion. So not a lot happens. I don't mean to be a, a critic of that particular art form. But so many art forms, particularly contemporary and uh, modern art, really dealt with issues about challenging our perceptions, trying to get past our judgmental. I was uh, just uh, finished reading, what is it, Judgment in Paris, uh, about the 
movement of the Impressionists. And uh, so you wouldn't, I mean, they were talking about how just the guy who invented a top hat was virtually stoned because it wasn't fashion. The, uh, it, it was a new avant-garde fashion to have a top hat uh, at that time. So we forget that so many um, uh, art forms really were designed in some sense. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. You, people are doing it anyway, but give back your precious items. <laughs> don't, you, don't want you to be thinking about that while we're talking. <laughs> So, um, so we do have to offer uh, some openness on our part and willingness uh, to go beyond what our uh, preconceptions are. You know, to go a little bit past, I know what kind of art I like and that's that and I don't want to be bothered. Do we all want to spend our lives going uh, through where we have the same comfortable experience over and over and over and over again? Uh, or do we want to build on that? Do we want to open up to other possibilities? And if you have any interest in the arts at all, you, you must have that desire, that willingness uh, to do it, just to uh, be willing to even go to a gallery or a show or a museum. Uh, so that, this is the beginning of the viewing process. The viewing process uh, has many steps in, involved in it that, that you can continue to grow with. But the most fundamental one that never, ever goes away is this notion of coming back to square one, to resting your senses, uh, allowing yourself to have a direct experience and seeing what arises from there um, and uh, letting that enrich your experience as opposed to, to filter it. So uh, we still have a mic and we can certainly take uh, some questions. Anyone? Um. I don't know how to frame this as a question, but I notice myself like categorizing things just over and over and over and over, and like I couldn't stop. Even like, okay, with there are like memory categorizations and stuff with like my object, and then it's like kind of easy to stop those because you just like cut the storyline, but that is. Uh, different with like other objects because it's more like noticing like a metaphysical trait of like okay this is a watch I know it has hands which are in positions and like I'm noticing what time it is but the the second hand was stuck and so that was funny and like mm -hmm. I don't know just mm -hmm. kind of like noticing that kind of stuff and like why would you can you speculate why by the way you're not the only person who does that so um, the, the question really is, do you have any speculation as to why we do that? Yeah. I mean, uh, to make reality. To make reality. Um, and there's uh, other ways of saying that, not that you have to say it my way, but would you elucidate on that a little bit? Uh, to make objects. I mean, I, I, I could, but I don't want to go into it. What is okay. your... Well, I think we often do it to, <laughs> my way is going to be the better way. <laughs> I think we do it to solidify our world. It's very, very uncomfortable when we don't have a category or a label for something. The, the, the reason um, why I think that is because um, if you don't have a, have a category, if you don't have a place to park it, you have to experience it again and again and again. And that's not very efficient. Okay, it's uh, in the, in a sense, it's like saying, "Let's not stop and smell the roses." It's extremely inefficient. If I can categorize that out of the corner of my eye, I don't have to re-experience it. So I can spend my entire life uh, kind of speeding through it, and I don't really have to experience it because I've got it all locked down. Okay, so we have this. Uh, what is it? Who I I know. Was it John Lennon? I think stole it from Kierkegaard or something about you know life happens while you're making plans. So uh, we do it because it helps us fill in all the gaps between our thoughts that normally arise, so that we don't have an experience. So we don't have that space that I'm talking about here, so that you have an experience because you have to deal with it. It may actually 
undercut the next thought. It may undercut the next category. You may have to change your life. You may have to rethink things. You may have to refeel them. It's very inconvenient. Another inconvenient truth. So, uh, so I think that's why we kind of do that. It, it gives the illusion of a solidified world. Yeah, absolutely. But um, then there was also kind of the the noticing of, um, I guess, like the fact that objects are objects, uh -huh. and that like even if it's a sock, I mean, that's a or a rose. You know, to know that there are roses, you have to. That's a very specific um, thing to notice. And like you've already categorized things to a certain extent to notice that, and so in art, I mean there are you know there are aesthetic philosophers who would explain this better, I guess. But I, it, you can get to a point where your interest in the object isn't isn't there, and so you're just kind of seeing these objects, these art objects, as objects, and. Um, it's kind of like seeing the world with like a fresh open view, I guess, if you just see everything for what it is, but don't take in what it is as what you think it is, you know? And like, the, it was interesting because when I got to that part and I was like, oh, well, this is an object. This watch is an object, <clears throat> just like this sock was an object. And there's kind of this, perfection and just like seeing these objects be because before sorry I'm not framing this all but um before when I had only looked at one object it was very easy for me to just be like oh this object and then have like fantasies about like this object even though it was a, it was a sock which um was like kind of weird because I was like oh I'm like in the sock there's socks everywhere I'm like what <laughs> just like no like come back to the sock there's oh. there's no way out of that which you just described <laughs> there's no way out of that except to let it dissolve mm. you can't chase a thought with another thought and expect the thoughts to stop and what meditation basically does is it short circuits it because it bores the thoughts to death okay um, I, I I mean I I don't I mean I grew up in New York City, so maybe I have a more negative view about describing meditation, but I mean it in a positive sense, that to me, boredom in meditation is a good thing. Okay. Because oh, yeah. what, it, what it represents is, is that you're actually beginning, your thoughts are, are, are sort of beginning to fade a little bit into the background. They don't stop. They're fading into the background a little bit, and you're actually touching the surface of being present. It's just that we don't like it. So we're bored. When you finally, at some point, you never, I don't think you really, in fact, Trump or Rinpoche, the gentleman over there, used to refer to it not so much as boredom going away, but it becoming cool boredom. It's actually refreshing because you know you're present and you're not resisting it anymore. So what meditation basically offers is, um, I don't want to say a solution or a resolution to thoughts because they're always there. It's just that we're not always going along for the ride. We don't have to go along for the ride. We don't have to label it an object. We could, but if we do, who cares? And if we don't, who cares? We're present. That's the most important thing. We're experiencing things as they are, which is the most important thing. So, um, you know, you, you raised aesthetics, which is a whole other interesting issue to talk about. We won't, we won't get into that uh, tonight. Yeah, I mean, uh, what I just wanted to yes. um, get at was that once you reach that point where just objects are objects, there's no distinguishing between like this art piece and that art piece and me and this post or whatever. And so we're able to see kind of the dignity that's inherent in the thing that is. And I was just wondering if maybe you could talk about that in like uh, accordance to uh, looking at things as art. Well, briefly, I want to get to Jason there, but briefly, um, I, there's something that you said that caught my ear. There's two wisdoms in part of this tradition. There's actually five, but there's two wisdoms that caught my attention. That is what I call the uh, wisdom of equanimity, which is seeing everything as the same, and discriminating awareness wisdom, which is seeing everything as different. It's like, oh, what? Huh? I mean, if it's a wisdom, it should supersede everything else, right? The point being is, is that uh, everything is inherently equal. 
But that doesn't mean it's the same. The waves are not the ocean. Okay. Ice is still water, but it's not fog. So is fog, it's still water. So things are different. They have their own inherent, we could say magic or appreciation or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, it's not one better than another. It's just like tonight, I was trying to say that thoughts are not bad because they come second when we allow ourselves naturally to experience the way we do in meditation. So when we order things and have put one, two, we think one is better than two. And it's not. So they're both of the same values, the wisdom of equanimity. At the same time, they're completely, utterly different experiences. That intuitive felt sense. We, if, you, if, you, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, we have all entered a room with other people and have probably, I, I hope we've had a similar type of experience, where there was somebody in that room that we either instantly liked or instantly didn't like, and we cannot explain that. And it, had, and, and it was even before pre-thought level. So we, we all have gut level. Felt sense is a gut sense. Okay. It's not an emotional sense. That's a different issue to talk about for another uh, evening. Um, but felt sense is you rest all your senses, you have an experience, and it's pre-language, pre-concept. And we can remind ourselves of that and appreciate that by developing a mindfulness meditation practice. Jason? Well, um, so obviously I agree with the whole meditative process. Like, I've bought into it. Um, After all, you are filming this. <laughs> <laughs> but if we take that aside, like always being fresh with every experience, okay, we can assume that I believe that, you believe that. But why is seeing art in a fresh way, what, what's the importance there beyond just the freshness? Is it a sense of... Um, experiencing things ourselves, experiencing what the artist was trying to say, the communication between the two, what, what, where's the real benefit here? Um, well, you've, there's three questions there. I think I'll, I'll, I'll try to narrow take, down just the take two the of them. One. <laughs> okay. uh, well, first of all, it is important in terms of this wisdom of equanimity is there really is no difference between art and a pile of shit. Okay, because it's all inherently equal. And in some ways, we could say interesting, and sometimes we confuse the two. Uh, but, <laughs> so there's that aspect of it, is having this unbiased vision of just willing, open, to just simply rest our senses on things without prejudging and analyzing and, and the things that we do. Okay. Now, why then is art somewhat different than other things? than a pile of something. And that is our wisdom, discriminating awareness wisdom, being able to see the difference between things. Um, art, in some sense, depending upon the artist in some way or other, is trying to communicate something. And in most cases, it's trying to create an experience. Even when art was very narrative and they were trying to tell a story of some Napoleon conquering some battle or uh, some religious figure doing some miracle, even when it was telling a story, it was trying to impart the experience of what it was like to be in that kind of situation. It's trying to communicate something that is transcultural, that is either pre-language uh, or not uh, controlled by language, so that there's some gut level thing going on. So it's kind of like when you fall in love. You know, there, there's all this talk about it, but when you're in the moment, it is what it is. Okay? And it has nothing to do with what you say about it. So in some sense, if I can equate some of this, it's a little like allowing yourself to fall in love with what's in front of you because what was created was done in some sense, I'm sure there are exceptions to this, out of some kind of love that the creator of that artwork did to share in some fashion. Okay? So um, it's a matter of just opening up and willingness to experience that. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So, you know, I look at a lot of art, and I, in the, as we're talking about this tonight, I find that some art just begs to be felt. Other art begs to be analyzed 
and I think it has to do with the artist because I think some yeah. and that's you talk about materials and, they, and some people use materials as materials. Some people try to express a feeling or a expression. We, that's the whole range of art, and, right. and I find it. And maybe it's, that's the discrimination. Some art I look at begs to be ignored, in my experience. So it's like all these experiences are happening based on yeah. what the object is yes. projecting to me. So. Yes, and it, there are so many art forms that, uh, that transverse uh, many, many areas. Uh, the uh, uh, area that often uh, people have the hardest time with, uh, uh, maybe not the hardest time, but a hard time with is uh, conceptual art. Because it's like, oh, well, that's all thought sense. Well, uh, let me describe two works of art to you that are by conceptual artists. Uh, one of that, Joseph Kosuth, I have his first name right? I sometimes mess up his first name. Uh, he's done this series where what he does is um, he uh, puts on the wall a uh, painting of the word definition of chair. And he puts uh, a chair and he puts the, a photograph of the chair. So he, he might argue with what I'm about to say if he ever saw this or whatever. But you're being asked, what is the chair? What makes a chair a chair? The definition of a chair, a photo of a chair, a representation is good enough. Is that chair? Is that chair ness? Is the chair itself chair? The chair. What makes what makes chair ness chair ness without concept? The experience of the chair. So what is that leading back? There's another one by. Um, it says um, there's a series of photographs of a, a driving along, and you come across across a little sign that says. Uh, landscape by anything, letter N E, think, okay, and then you it says start viewing, <laughs> and then you go a little way longer there, and then it says stop viewing. It shows, uh, a map of where you just drove. So we could say, yeah, that's very thoughtful, but it's challenging our thoughts that are that our map, as Korzybitsky would say. The map is not the territory. Your thoughts are not the experience. But you can use thoughts to evoke an experience. If that were not true, why would we have poetry? So they work hand in hand. It's just in terms of experience. We want to allow ourselves to have our own personal experience. Otherwise, you know, we might as well just hire people to tell us what to think and what to do in the morning and everything else. But I guess I lie is, but the artist is either creating something to, oh, here's the word I'll use, manipulate us to experience what the artist wants to convey, and it kind of doesn't always give us the free will choice to experience it ourselves, because they have... Not, so, not help necessarily. Me understand. So not what, necessarily. There's a, there's a, there's a, because there are some forms of artwork which there is no in, uh, intent upon the artist, and you make up your part of it. Your, in fact, your part of it is an integral part of it. it. There's art forms in which, you know, in Shambhala art, we, or at least I go into more that kind of element of the participa uh, participation of, of um, uh, the viewer and how integral it is. But um, Damien Hirst used to say, um, uh, before I should preface it by saying that, and we should probably wind this up, but uh, uh, there's, uh, I always say art is always some form of communication. There's absolutely no out to that. There's no way you can get out of that one. Okay, so Damien Hirst, not in response to me, but has said previously that sometimes he doesn't want to communicate anything at all. Okay, or his artwork doesn't communicate anything at all. Well, it communicates that. You, you, you can't get out of that. There's something that's going on. And uh, you know, communication itself, if you think about it, is quite magical in and of itself. You know, that we can actually, I can flap my lips and vocal cords and make these little sound waves that go in your ear and something happens in your head and you actually have some idea of what this is all about. So that's in itself quite magical when you think about it.